Micah chapter 7 verse 18 says this Who is like a God like you pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage Let's turn to the Lord in prayer let us all pray Our heavenly Father and our gracious God we thank you that you are such a great God we thank you that you are holy we thank you that we do come to you. Father, we come to you not through ourselves. We come to you in and through that worthy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for that name that far surpasses any other. We thank you that the Lord Jesus is our saviour and our friend when we trust in him. We thank you, O oh Father, that you sent your Son into the world, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Oh, Father, we praise you, we thank you, we especially praise you for the fact that you are a great God. We thank you that you're great in your forgiveness. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, taking away our sins? We thank you that you're a pardoning God. We thank you that you're a forgiving God. We thank you that as far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. We thank you that our sins are forgiven through the Lord Jesus, through what the Lord Jesus achieved by his perfect and spotless life. And then we thank you that he went to Calvary and shed his blood for wretches and unworthy people such as ourselves. Oh, Father, we are sinners through and through. We are indeed iniquitous people, but yet we thank you for the cleansing blood of Jesus Father, we come back again to you and we pray that you would be near us. Father, we pray that you would give us grace and help and strength and mercy. Father, we are sorry for our sins. They offend you. You are holy in your character. Our thoughts, O oh Lord, often awry. Our words are not often pleasing. And our heart attitudes, O oh Lord, display our sin. Father, we pray that you would forgive us. May there be grace abounding to the chief of sinners. Oh, Father, we pray that there would be forgiveness of our sins through the blood of the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. We thank you for the undeserved kindness of you, our God. We praise you. We thank you. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the great sufficiency of Jesus Christ and we're praying now that you would be with us still our hearts O God so that we may be focused on you take away those thoughts of distraction that come into our minds when we come to worship you father our minds are so full of many things but father we pray that our minds our gaze our heart would be on you father we praise you for the Holy Spirit we pray again for him to open up and illuminate your word we pray that we would be knowing you. You are great and your son is great and your spirit is glorious. Oh, Father, come upon us, O oh Lord. Come and do us good at this time. We need you and we need you now. And Father, we do pray for much grace. Oh, come and be near to us. Comfort the saints. Convict the sinners. Be with us, we pray. In every ounce of our time, we ask. Oh, Father, we pray for your precious presence. We ask for your dealings and your moving and your working. Lord, we are dependent on you entirely and we pray for much grace and favour. We pray for the strength of Jesus Christ to be made known. Walk with us, Lord. Go with us. Go before us. Watch over our steps, we pray. Be near to us, O God, and give us much grace and much blessing Father, may Calvary be real to us. May the things of Jesus be precious to us. Lord, watch over, we pray, our souls and do us good and be near us, O God. We pray for all watching this video. May they be blessed in their soul. Be near to each one, we ask. And may there be a favour of heaven from you. O oh God, we pray, do good to those who do good, Lord. Come upon your saints, the apples of your eye. 
be nigh to them, Lord, and give them grace and courage and strength and favour from you. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Bible reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, and we're beginning to read at verse 9 to the end of verse 20. Mark, chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 9 to the end of the 20th verse. Let's hear the Word of God. Mark, chapter 1, from verse 9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John, in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered. To him. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further from there, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. I'm sure that you've seen cows, haven't you? Many cows. Maybe you've been to Whitley near Thornhill and you've seen cows in the field. Sometimes on, on, on both sides you can see cows. I wonder if you know how many stomachs 
a cow has. Do you know how many stomachs a cow has? Would it surprise you if I told you that cows have four stomachs? Can you believe that? Four stomachs. I mean, we have one stomach, and I'm sure it gets hungry when you've not been eating for a while, and then you, you, you have your lunch and, and you fill up again. But imagine having four stomachs. It's probably just as well, because what do you see a cow do? What do you see a cow do? You often see them, and they're munching in the grass, aren't they? They're munching away. And what they do is they, they chew. They don't just gulp the grass down. They chew the cud. So important, they chew the cud. Well, some of our early forefathers, who early Christians, and they used to look at the cows, and they used to say this, chew the cud. And what they meant by that was not to chew grass. They didn't mean that. What they meant was this, that we're to digest the Bible. We're to think about it. We're to chew the cud. We're to meditate on it. We're to think deeply on it. We're not just to read the Bible and go away and forget our appearance, but we are to meditate on the things we've heard. It might be a family time and we hear the Bible being read. Maybe it's at the time like this when we hear it being spoken and applied to our lives, being preached. We're to meditate on it, think about it and do it. Maybe it's at some other time when we're reading it privately and we're to think about what we're reading. Psalm 1 begins like this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. That means he thinks about it deeply, day and night. All the time, in other words, he's thinking about the Bible. What about you? A really blessed man, that means a happy man, is always thinking about God and his word. Do you do that? Do you think about God and his word, particularly the Lord Jesus who died from the cross for our sins? I hope that you think things through and that you put it into practice in your life. So you remember that when you see a cow. We're going to once again pray and we're going to seek the Lord's face. Let's now turn to the Lord again in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and great God, we thank you for that lesson of the cows that chew the cud. Help us, Lord, we pray, to chew the cud of your precious word. We thank you, Lord, for the truths of the scriptures. We thank you for the truths of the precious, precious book divine. We pray, Lord, that we think about the Bible. We pray that you would apply it to our lives. We ask, Lord, that the Lord Jesus would be praised and that you would help us. Father, we pray for those who are serving you. We pray especially for those who are serving you on the mission field. We pray that you would be near them and give them grace and blessing and strength and favour from you. Father, we pray that you would watch over them and be with them and give them grace and strength and blessing. Father, we pray that you would be near to us. We ask that you would help us not just to hear your word, but we pray that we would put it into practice in our lives. We ask that we would be doers of your word and not hearers only. Father, we pray that you would speak to us directly, particularly through the scriptures. Oh God, may there be a many a blessing for us reserved in your most holy book. Oh Father, speak to us, we pray. Make us listen indeed. May we be lovers of Jesus. Forgive us our sins before we come to your word. May we come with clean hands and a pure heart. Oh Father, Hasten your work, we pray, even in these difficult days. We pray once again in them. We pray for this difficult time. We pray for those that are shielded. Really bless them. Really help, Lord. Really give grace and blessing every day. Pray for those, O oh Lord, and who, who have just fed up with it. We do pray that you give them grace and blessing. You've put us, Lord, in your providence at this time. And Father, we pray that you would bless us and strengthen us, and help us, and be near us. So watch over us then, O oh God, we ask. 
please help this message. We pray that you help me as I preach. We pray for whoever listens to this, that they may be blessed of you, blessed by your spirit. Please, Lord, be near us, we ask, and do us good and help us. In Jesus' worthy name we pray. Amen. I don't know if you've heard of the story of Mary Jones and her Bible. Many years ago, there was a girl who grew up in a little village in Wales from a very poor family. But she wanted a Bible in Welsh, which was very rare in those days. There was one nearby that she did go to the house and maybe for a few hours at a time she could be able to read it for herself. But she wanted a Bible of her own, a Bible that she could read. She saved up for six whole years for a Bible and eventually she could go and get one. But there wasn't a local bookshop nearby. She couldn't go to Amazon like we do on the internet. So what did she have to do? Well, she had to walk for 25 miles, 25 miles to a place called Bala, and there she would get a Bible for a man called Thomas Charles. She did the long journey, and eventually she got her Bible, and she walked home. The trip home, the 25 miles home, was a lot quicker because she was so full of joy. And when she was weary from her journey, she sat down. And guess what she did? You've got it. She read her Bible. And she started at Mark chapter 1. And she read it and read it and she learned it. And before she got back to her village, she had learned Mark chapter 1. Isn't that amazing? Even before she got back to the village, she was so thrilled with her Bible that she had learned Mark chapter 1. And she would have learnt the passage that we're going to be looking at. That's verses 16 to 20. And she would have learnt about Jesus calling some of his disciples. And that's what we're going to look at. And we're going to see it under two main points. First of all, Christ called. Secondly, the disciples obeyed. So let's look first of all then at the fact that Christ called. Jesus at this point is in Galilee. He's preaching. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. He's preaching the glad tidings. How sinners, those that have rebelled against God, can be right with God. If they turn from their sin, and that's true for you. If you turn from your sin and come to know the Lord Jesus Christ by what he's done on the cross of Calvary. Jesus has been preaching this particular message. He's by the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee was six miles from side to side with ways. It was 12 miles end to end long ways in terms of its length. So it's not very much of a sea, we could say. It's a lake that we would really call it, the Lake Galilee. But it's called here the Sea of Galilee. And it was great for fishing. It had a booming fishing industry. And Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. And he sees two brothers. One of them was Simon, who we know Simon Peter. And the other one was Andrew, his brother. Now there's a parallel account in Luke of this particular account. Mark, as we've been saying, summarises only. He just gives the bare facts. But if you were to go into Luke's Gospel, you get a more fuller account of what happened. Jesus was by the sea and he was in Simon's boat. And he sat down in Simon's boat and he taught the crowd. He preached to them. And after that he said to Simon... Launch out your net in the deep for a catch. This was his reply. Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. We've caught nothing. Nothing at all. We've caught. He said, but nevertheless, at your word, and down went the net. And they caught this massive load of fish. In fact, they had to get another boat to help them. And two of these boats were sinking under the weight. And when Peter got to shore... 
This is what he said. Depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. You see, when Peter saw the greatness of Christ, he saw his own unworthiness. He saw the greatness of Christ and he saw the sinfulness of his own heart. And the more that you and I see the greatness of Jesus Christ, the more we see our sinfulness and our own unworthiness before such a person. It's like this. Imagine a man is travelling and he's walking at night and he falls into a muddy puddle. And he knows he's dirty. But he doesn't quite know how much he's dirty. And the nearer he gets to that street lamp in the distance, the more he realises just something of how dirty he is. And the more that we go near to Jesus and his light and his glory, we're like Peter and we realise our own sinfulness. We realise our own unworthiness and inadequacy. And we say we're sinners and come to the Lord Jesus. We need that humility, don't we? That who we are is sinners and we need Jesus to save us of our sins. I hope he has done that. We see our own sinfulness in the light of Christ's greatness. Well, it's in that context that Jesus calls Simon. We have it recorded, verse 16. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. That was their job. That was their trade. They were fishermen. And Jesus says to them, come after me. Follow me. That's what it literally is. Come after me. Follow me. And that issue of a call comes to you and me. Christ says to you and me, follow me. Christ would say, follow me. He calls out to us for us to follow him. Will we obey the call? Because Jesus actually, in a gracious way, commands Peter and Andrew, his brother, to follow him. To follow him. He says, follow me. And Jesus offers that command to you and me. He says, follow me. Come after me. Please come after me. He's, he's urging us. He's commanding us to come after him. There's this call of authority that goes out to Simon and to Andrew. To follow after our Lord Jesus Christ. And that goes out to you and me tonight. Following the Lord Jesus. Are you following the Lord Jesus? Have you heard that call? Have you heard the voice of Jesus softly pleading in your heart, the hymn says. Following the Lord Jesus Christ. Making sure we're following after him. That command goes out to Peter and to his brother Andrew. Follow after me. Come after me. And that means complete and utter discipleship. You see, what Jesus was asking was not a passing interest, was it? Jesus wasn't saying to Simon and to Andrew, well, if you mind awfully just having a bit of interest in me, that when I'm just around these parts in the Sea of Galilee in my ministry, just pop on by and hear me once in a while. That's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus was asking Andrew and Simon for nothing short than complete and utter obedience to himself. He was asking for complete commitment he was saying to follow after him whatever happens and that is the cost of discipleship and that is what Jesus wants from us isn't it Christ wants all of us he wants us to follow after him completely and utterly devotedly following after the Lord Jesus Christ you can tell can't you with a sporting fan 
whether or not they're really interested in their club or not. One of the telltale signs is this. How much do they follow them when the team is not doing well? It's easy, isn't it, to say, I support this club when they're running through a string of results and they're, and they're winning and everything's fine and everything's wonderful and everything's glorious and, and they're winning match after match and they have, they have a right string of results and that's great. But what about when they are losing? What about when there's a string of defeats? A true supporter will follow after their club through thick and thin. They're not glory supporters. And it's the same with Jesus. We must follow after Christ. That is what Jesus said to the disciples. That is what he says to you and me. We're to follow after him through thick and thin, through rough and smooth, through easy and hard. That's what it is to follow Jesus. Not following him in fair weather. Not following him when things are easy. Not following him when there's not really a cost. Following after Jesus all the time. I remember when I was a teenager in my late teens and I read a book called True Discipleship by William MacDonald. Very, very powerful book. Very hard-hitting book. And it just talking about that. True discipleship. What it is to go after Jesus. He doesn't just want our weekends. He doesn't just want our evenings. He wants all of us. He wants us to be united to him. To be joined to the Lord Jesus Christ. To be following after Jesus. Are you following after the Lord Jesus Christ like that? Through thick and thin. Following after the Lord. To follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus is worthy to be followed after. He is. He's worthy in every way. If these disciples were going to down their tools, they were going to down their nets and follow after this man from Nazareth, they needed to know, he's, is he worthy? Is this a right move? And in every way, Jesus is worthy to be followed. In every sense and in every way. He's worthy. He's perfect. You remember the, what the Father said at Jesus' baptism. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well placed. The Father put the, his emphasis on the Son. He approved of what the Son was doing. He says he's worthy. And Jesus is worthy. He's worthy of our following. He's worthy of our adoration. Is the Lord Jesus Christ in every way. This Jesus would do what he said. He said he would go and die on the cross. And he went and died on the cross. And he shed his precious blood so that sinners, rebels like, like us, can be forgiven and pardoned. Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity. He's worthy in every way. They're singing in heaven. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. He is worthy indeed. He's worthy to be followed after. He is truly worthy. But what would Jesus make these disciples? He said, follow me. And then what did he say? Did you pick it up in the reading? Let's have a look at it. Here in verse 17. Then Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. They were fishermen. But now Jesus was going to make them fishers of men. They were going to catch, not fish from the Sea of Galilee, they were going to catch men. They were going to be soul winners for the Lord. A friend of mine once went on beach missions. And he went on beach missions from England over to Ireland. And at that time he hitchhiked. He wanted to get on a with a car to go onto the ferry. And he didn't know what car to go on. And he was praying, Lord, send me a car and send me a Christian. That's what he was praying. Send me a car and send me a Christian. So that he could go with this man onto the ferry as they were all lining up in the cars to go onto this ferry, to go over to Ireland. He was saying, Lord, send me a car, send me a Christian. Well, he knocked on the window of a car. The window went down. He explained to him, he said, can I hitchhike? He said, fine, come on in. And there's lots of, lots of fishing rods there. So Vinny said to this man, he said, what are you doing? 
So this man said, I'm going fishing. So you know what Vinny said, don't you? So am I. But Vinny was going not to catch fish, but to catch men. I will make you fishers of men to catch souls. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, He who wins souls is wise. He who wins souls is wise. There is a concern for these disciples to go and to win other souls for Jesus. To come and to be soul winners for the Master. To see other disciples won for Jesus Christ. And when anyone comes to know Jesus Christ, really inside of them there is this concern that they must tell others about Jesus, that they must be fishers of men, being soul winners for our dear Lord Jesus Christ. Are you a soul winner? Are you a fisher of men? But notice who's going to do the work. What did Jesus say? Mark 1, 17. Then Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. I will make you become fishers of men. It's Jesus that's going to do the work. He's the one that's going to make them fishers of men. It's Jesus that's going to do it. It's Jesus that's going to mould and make these disciples like a potter with his clay, like a child with his meccano. He's going to mould these men. He's going to take these fishermen, these rough diamonds, and he's going to work on them, and they're going to be sparkling for his kingdom. And they're going to be soul winners for him. He's going to do the work. And it's Christ that makes us soul winners. It's Jesus that so works in us. So helps us that he makes us fishers of men. Christ called. Secondly, the disciples obeyed. Jesus went on a little bit further from there. And there were two other brothers. So there were four fishermen in this account and there were two sets of brothers. So we've looked at Andrew and we've looked at Simon. Now these two were James and John and they also were fishermen. These four disciples that Jesus called were fishermen. Now we mustn't give the impression that these men were a hamper short of a picnic. We mustn't think that they did not have all their wits about them. They were good, normal, intelligent people. You just have to read Peter's letters. And of course he was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he was moved along by the Holy Spirit as he wrote 1 and 2 Peter. And John was under the inspiration of the Spirit as he wrote John's Gospel and the three letters and Revelation. We understand that of course. But they were given their own personality. And they had a mind to think that the Holy Spirit worked on them in. And they were clearly good, intelligent men. We mustn't think that they were somehow deficient in their, in their mental faculties. That's not the case. But yet we must remember that these were just common fishermen. That's what they were. Poor, despised, humble fishermen. They were not people of rank, they were not people of nobility, they were not people of high esteem, they were not likely to, to be over the Jerusalem times if you like, they were normal run of the mill ordinary fishermen. Hard work, smelly work, arduous work, doing night nice shifts, trying to catch fish. Yes, intelligent, with all the fishing quota and, and managing the business. Yes, but nonetheless, normal, intelligent people. Not people of high nobility. Jesus didn't go and call the scribes and the Pharisees. He didn't say to them, follow me. He said to these humble fishermen, these normal people, these commoners, mud folk, like you and me probably. Normal, run-of-the-mill Normal, roll up your sleeves and get on with it, men. And that's how the gospel normally gets put forward. God uses the normal people, 
No people of high nobility, just an ordinary folk to do his bidding. You remember Paul when he, he spoke in, in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians and chapter 1. This is what he said in verse 26 to verse 29. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble accord, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the things that are. Put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised. God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. You see your calling, brother. Not many wise. Now, Jesus didn't say, it's been often pointed out, he didn't say not any wise. Now, God can use noble people. God can use people of high rank, of high birth, of high nobility, of high dignitaries. God can use them, and we mustn't have reverse snobbery and say that he doesn't, but yet there are not many. How does God's work progress? And the answer is through ordinary, humble, humdrum men and women, mundane people like you and me. Because maybe you sit there and you say, how can God use me? I'm so ordinary. How can God use me? I've not got the brains of some of these theologians. Well, sometimes you don't want some of the brains of these so-called theologians. How can he use me? How can he work on me? How can I do anything? And then verses like this come to us. You see your calling, brethren, not many. Not many, mighty according to the flesh. Not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. That's what God does. He uses the base things of the world. God uses the unusual you would never have expected. If you went down to Galilee before Jesus called these men and you saw Simon and you saw Andrew there casting out their nets, normal day's work. And you went, went on and you saw James and John mending their nets with tricky work. You wouldn't have thought, these are men who are going to set the world alight here, folk. You would never think that, would you? You just think they're ordinary fishermen getting on with their job. Like other people in the Sea of Galilee at that time. But here were men who Jesus used and moulded. And guess what? These were going to be the men that were going to set the world completely alight with the gospel by the Holy Spirit. And we must never despise poor people. And we must never be browbeaten to think we can do nothing for the Lord unless we're somehow sophisticated. Friends, we're nothing. But your use is us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellency of the power of God may be of him and not of us. So that no person should glory in their presence. How could Peter glory in his presence? He was just an ordinary bloke. You remember in Acts when Peter was preaching in front of the Sanhedrin and he was filled with the Spirit. And what was his subject? He preached Christ. And it says this in Acts 4 verse 13. They perceived, that's the Sanhedrin, that Peter and John were uneducated, unlearned men, uneducated, untrained men, and they perceived, they took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. That's the key. Had been with Jesus. Had been with Christ. That's the issue. They're un uneducated and untrained men had these two fishermen and they were preaching in front of the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of the day, in a powerful way. And they said, they've been with Jesus. They took knowledge of them. They've been with Jesus. And that's what it is. It's being with Christ. Poor despised man. He uses us. We should take courage in that fact, shouldn't we? So they obey. And that is incommendable, isn't it? They actually obeyed. We're told, aren't we? First of all, with Simon and Andrew. Verse 18. They immediately left their nets and followed him. They followed Christ. 
They put down their, their nets that they were throwing out. They put down their nets. They downed their nets and they followed after Jesus. Same thing with, with James and John. Verse 20, and immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. They obeyed. They were like an obedient dog with the master. They were like a servant to the monarch. They were like a child who's obedient to, when, to his parent when he calls. We must be obedient to the master's call. When the master comes to you and me and he says, follow me. When the Lord Jesus would say to you and me, follow me. When the Lord Jesus would say to us, come after me, follow me. We are to do the same thing. We're to follow Christ. We're to be obedient. We're to trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We're to obey. And also notice the cost. What a cost it must have been for these disciples. Now granted Zebedee was still there to carry on the fishing business. Granted the hired servants were still there, of course. Granted that they went back fishing at least once in John 21. We know that. But nonetheless take nothing away from the sacrifice and the cost that these disciples went through. Sometimes we just read the story and I think that's a nice story. You know, Jesus, he walks by the Sea of Galilee and he calls Simon and Andrew and they, they, put, they put down their nets and they follow him and then he goes on to, to James and John and they put down their nets and they follow after Jesus and we think that's a nice story, isn't it? But don't forget the sacrifice. Here was a man of Nazareth. Here was not a person that they had been groaning up with for, for all their life and they knew him and so when he said, follow me, they said, oh yeah, that'll be easy. We'll follow after Jesus. No, no, this man was a relatively new man. Now again, we need to be careful because we know from the parallel account in Luke 5 that Jesus has preached in their hearing so they know something of what he's about. So it's not a completely cold call, is it? But nonetheless, it takes nothing away from the fact that these disciples, they put down their nets and they follow after Jesus. They turn their back on their careers. They turn their back on their livelihoods. They go to the unknowns of following this man from Nazareth. They go away from their way of life. This was a family fishing business, no doubt. And yet they follow after our Lord Jesus Christ. They go after the Saviour. What a sacrifice that was. It is a great sacrifice. And you know, it is a sacrifice to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. A tremendous sacrifice. This is what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And few who find it. It's difficult. You ask any Christian and you say this, is it easy being a Christian? And they'll have to say, no, at times it's very difficult being a Christian. And then you ask them this question. And they'll say with equal certainty, if not more, is it worth being a Christian? And they say, absolutely. And it is. It's not easy being a Christian. It's a cost. It's a sacrifice. And we've got to face up to that. But, oh, it is worth it being a Christian. It really is. And here, these disciples, they follow after the Lord Jesus Christ, despite the cost, despite the sacrifice. And we must follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is costly. But also notice the immediacy of their following after Jesus. They didn't take time to think about it. They didn't say, come on, let me just sit down over here for a couple of days and let's just meditate on what I'm about to do here. Because humanly speaking, it's crazy to leave their way of life behind them, to leave their fishing industry away and then to follow after Jesus. It's humanly crackers, isn't it? But this is what the master wants. And spiritually, it's great. Humanly crackers, spiritually great. 
to, to, to follow after this man. And they did it immediately. They followed after Jesus immediately. Look at verse 18. It's the same with the two sets of brothers. Verse 18. They immediately left their nets and followed him. This key verse, in, key word in Mark, isn't it? Immediately. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Verse 20. And immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Didn't matter whether it was Simon or Andrew or James and John. They both immediately went after the Lord Jesus. They followed him at once. They followed him straight away. They followed him directly. They followed him, no questions asked. They followed him, they downed their nets and they went after Jesus immediately. What a lesson that is for us, isn't it? You see, here are these disciples and they follow after Jesus straight away. You know, sometimes we're so often making excuses, aren't we? We're so often making excuses. Well, I don't know about this. I can't follow Jesus because of this. And I can't do what Jesus says because of that. And I can't do this because of this. And I can't do this. And I can't do that. And I can't do the other. And this is this. And this is that. And we make excuses all the time, don't we? But these disciples, if they had any reason to make excuses, you would have thought it would be now, wouldn't you? If that was us, we'd be like, oh, hang on a minute. Let me just have time to mull this over. Let me have time just to think this one through here, Jesus. We would have said that, wouldn't we? These disciples, they immediately followed after Jesus Christ and went. We need to do what Jesus says immediately. He calls, we obey. It's as simple as that. He calls, we obey. Oh, let's be prompt at following after the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's be quick in following after the master. Let's have obedient feet to do it quickly. Not just say, ah, no, it doesn't mean that. No, 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 going round it and saying, oh, I don't know if I can, and, and twisting round it. No, we follow. Jesus says and we follow. He obey immediately after the Lord Jesus Christ. Follow him straight away. Follow him directly. Follow him quickly. But follow him. That's the issue. These disciples followed Christ. That's the challenge of this section. That's the challenge of these disciples. They followed after Jesus. They went after the master. Let's do the same. Let's follow Christ. Let's be obedient to him. Follow him. Follow him. Yield your life to him. He has conquered death. He is King of Kings, except the joy which he gives to those who yield their lives.
let's now pray together. Our Heavenly Father and our gracious God, we do pray that we would follow Jesus. Father, we do pray that we would follow after him through thick and thin. May we ever be disciples of Jesus. May we ever follow after the Master. Please forgive us, O Lord, we pray. Watch over us, our Father, we ask. Give us grace. Help us, O God. Pardon us, we pray. Help us, O Lord. We pray that you would be near us. We pray that you would bless us. May we follow Jesus all the days of our life. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Saviour alone is wise. Be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.